My name is Doug Vakoc. I'm president of METI, an organization dedicated to messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. It's, it is virtually inconceivable to me that there isn't intelligence somewhere in the universe. And to me, it's just numbers. I mean, there are over 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone. And we know that stars have at least one planet on average. Maybe one out of five of those star systems has a potentially habitable Earth-like planet. So billions of planets that could be inhabited in our galaxy, and then billions of other galaxies. So I don't believe in miracles. And so it would really be a miracle if out of all of those stars, ours was the only one that had planets that bear life and that becomes intelligent. But to me, the bigger question, the more relevant question is, um, are those civilizations close enough and are they motivated enough to make contact? And that's where I, I am completely agnostic because maybe we're the only civilization in the Milky Way galaxy. And if that's the case, we're effectively isolated unless civilizations are so advanced that they can signal from another galaxy. Or, or maybe there are civilizations at all of the stars out there, but all they're doing is SETI. They're simply listening and everyone's waiting for everyone else to take the initiative. And then it's gonna be a really quiet universe. And so with Maddie, we're saying, maybe there are some civilizations out there and, and maybe it's the audacious young civilization like us that needs to take the initiative to make first contact. When we want to communicate with extraterrestrials, we need a kind of signal that is going to be able to cut through interstellar space. And radio waves are great for that. I mean, we use them to communicate with one another here on Earth, but we can also direct them to specific stars. The typical way of sending information in a radio signal is to send two different frequencies. So think of it as tone, sort of boop, beep, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep. We do it in a basic binary code, ones and zeros. And the ones are sent at one frequency, the zeros are sent at a different frequency. And so all we have to do is a little tweak of the frequency and we can send a tremendous amount of information encoded very compactly. You know, if you ask people what they would want to send to an extraterrestrial, a lot of them say what we look like. I mean, and that's what we're fascinated by ourselves. We're actually a fairly narcissistic species. And so the thing that we are most enthralled about is us. Uh, if you look at the pictures that we sent on the Voyager recording, this is a NASA spacecraft that included over 100 images of Earth. Well over 50 of them show human beings. Uh, and so uh, it's a natural thing that we would want to portray. In fact, uh, the world's most famous message that was beamed into space was sent from uh, the world's largest radio telescope in Arecibo, Puerto Rico in 1974. And the part that most people can recognize is this little stick figure in the middle. Um, the rest of it is all about science and math and you know, you've got to be uh, kind of well versed in those disciplines and imaginative even then to interpret it. But the one thing that stands out to us human beings is a picture of ourselves. The Voyager spacecraft uh, included pictures of Earth. So uh, it was a combination of music from around the world, greetings in 55 languages, and then a bunch of pictures, starting out with a, a basic scientific tutorial, description of chemistry, and then shots of the planets within our solar system, where our solar system is in the galaxy, uh, and then some pictures of Earth, um, an evolutionary sound montage of Earth. Hello from the children of planet Earth. But then there was a shift to showing pictures and many of them were of the human body. So the goal was to try to exemplify the range of cultures, the range of practices we have as individuals to give a little bit of a sense of uh, even our community or some of our values. One of the difficulties of sending an individual image uh, is that you have to try to encompass the whole body in one shot. We instead said um, we want to introduce the idea of showing something in close up, taking the camera and zooming in if you want to show a human body 
we then zoomed in on the head, zoomed in on the eye, show the eye closing, and then just showing some basic concepts of grammar as well, so that we have um, things like human bodies and arms and eyes, so those are nouns. They do things like um, arms raise, eyes close, and they do them in different ways. Eyes can close very slowly, or eyes can close rapidly. The idea is communication with extraterrestrials has to be more than what it has been in the past. In the past interstellar messages that have been beamed out, they've really been more symbolic efforts. They've been a one-shot attempt to communicate with a particular star system, but as we move into the future, we need to get used to targeting the same star over and over and over, sending increasingly rich messages. Part of the advantage of not trying to send everything in one message is that it gives the extraterrestrials an opportunity to test whether they understood it. So one of our messages is to send the periodic table of elements. The hope is the extraterrestrials will say, ah, we recognize this pattern. These are things that we find in nature. We think of how they're connected to one another a little differently, but no, we understand these patterns that are reflected in the patterns of chemicals in nature. Music is a, a beautiful starting point for an interstellar message precisely because of its mathematical and physical nature. And, and the reason we emphasize math and physics is because we assume the extraterrestrials need that to send signals in the first place. I, I mean, if you don't know some basic principles of math and physics, if you don't know something as basic as one plus one equals two, you're probably not gonna be a very good engineer. So you're not gonna build the radio receiver that gets our message in the first place. But if you can build that, you probably know the fundamentals of science. The beauty of music is that at its core, you can explain the basic concepts of music in terms of math and physics. I mean, just think, if you think of a, a, a musical tone, it has a certain frequency, it has a certain duration, it has a certain intensity. And so when Medi sent our first message to a nearby star, it was to create a mathematical tutorial to help them understand music. And unlike some of the past messages that have tried to explain everything, our goal was to explain one thing very clearly, the radio signal itself. And so in our message, we focused on talking about time through giving examples of radio signals that last different durations, one second, two seconds, three seconds. We explained the concept of a frequency by sending different frequencies and then giving a basic mathematical explanation. Because, you know, it, it would be wonderful if every time we made contact with an extraterrestrial, it would be through an artifact like the Voyager spacecraft. We'd have something in front of us. Um, we don't have that luxury with radio. The only thing we have is the radio signal itself. And then we have to extract the information. So our initial message was to say, let's talk about the radio signal itself, because that's something that you and we have in common. The radio messages we've sent so far are limited by the medium of transmission, radio waves. There's only so much information you can pack in each second of transmission. In METI's next generation of interstellar transmissions, we're sending much more information-rich signals by using optical transmission. So lasers sending brief pulses that can pack in the equivalent of a novel every second. That means when we describe the human body in motion, it's not just a crude stick figure with very slow animations, but we're using motion capture technologies to show nuances of the human body at a thousand frames per second, three-dimensional bodies in motion. So now we can really start showing how we interact with one another, start explaining some of the intricacies of our engagement, even begin to send some rudimentary interstellar morality plays. For SETI to succeed, we need to take a much longer term perspective. I think one of the big challenges we have today is that we expect immediate results, and with METI, you just can't have that. So it is an exercise in patience, 
And one of the things we need to do in order to fulfill our basic goal is to have a more sustainable society. And so in our next activities, we're going to be fostering more of a sense of uh, environmental awareness and ability to be attuned to ourselves as part of this world. One of the big questions that we have to face when we're doing a project like Maddie is, um, are we actually going to survive long enough? I mean, I think that has been the greatest obstacle because we don't have an assurance. Some have said we're too young as a civilization even to take on an activity that could require centuries or millennia to succeed. And so I think it's important to face up front what happens. What happens if after all of our efforts uh, we fail? So let's look at the worst case scenario. Let's imagine that uh, over the course of um, many years, many decades, we have progressively more ambitious projects. We target not just a few nearby stars, but hundreds and thousands, um, even millions of stars. And then we begin the long process of waiting. And we wait and we listen for signals for hundreds of years, thousands of years, and all we get during all of this time is this vast cosmic silence. What then? Slowly, I think, we're going to come to this realization that, you know, because we committed ourselves to this project that so many people said couldn't be done and that had such a long time frame and required such a commitment and yet a thousand years from now we're still doing slowly we're going to realize that in the process of looking for intelligence out there we actually became that same long-lived civilization that we've looked for out there all along so if that's what we discover at the end of our search, not intelligence out there, but a little bit greater intelligence on this world, I think that's a pretty good consolation prize. I think there's often a, a, a sense of um, why should a young civilization like us take the initiative? In the early days of SETI, uh, there's an engineer at Stanford University named Ronald Bracewell, and he, he created this image of a galactic club. And he said, SETI is our attempt to join the galactic club. What I always find so ironic is that everyone wants to join the club. No one seems to be willing to pay any dues or even send an application. And that's what we're trying to do with METI. And maybe it's the way that we're going to make first contact.